Hi, Denise. Hi. Thank you so much for coming and sharing some time with us and being a part of the C19 experience. Well, thank you for having me. Yes. So I would love to talk to you a little bit about a lot of things. Okay. But first, I want to I want to talk to you about life before COVID and then like what it was like mm -hmm when COVID came in. Now we, as sort of lay people, you know, we have always in, in some way put healthcare workers like on a pedestal, right? They know more about these things than we know. But when COVID came, there, there was no training on COVID, I'm sure, before it came. So what was it like transitioning into the COVID world? Well, I'll be pre-COVID, yeah. pre-COVID, um, I would say that working in the emergency room was very, can I say whatever I want? Yeah. So it was very much like ER. Yeah. But there was not as much sex. Oh. I kept going into the closets. They were empty. No one was there's in there. No, no, it's hard work. Jeez. There's long hours. Yeah. There's no eating. There's yeah. no potty breaks. There's Ugh. a lot of um, happiness with your staff because you have all have kind of this raunchy personality yes, sense yeah, yeah. of humor. Yes. Because that's your armor when you work in the emergency department. Mm -hmm. You have to surround yourself with an army. Yeah. And so there's that kind of laughter. Mm -hmm. There's um, sadness. Yeah. Fear. Every day that you go to work you're a little bit afraid of what mm -hmm. you're going to see. So and I never thought I knew more than anyone else. I just was out there trying to take care of patients. Yeah. You know. Doing your best. Yes, yeah, just doing my best. Yeah. Day to day. So that's pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. A lot like ER. I love it. But, so. Yeah, not as spicy. Not as spicy. There's not as much romance. There's no time for romance. Yeah. So. Um, that's where Hollywood comes in. That's where Hollywood. <laughs> I'm waiting for that. That. We do a podcast of the reality. I love that. I it, love it. You can call it empty closet. <gasps> Ooh, right? you that's um what is that? Um you have to you own that now. Uh, you own that now. Hashtag. Yes, empty baby. closet. <laughs> empty closet. I love it. So then COVID came and COVID was scary. When I first heard about COVID, I didn't I didn't think it was anything worse than influenza. Mm -hmm. Like we've had really bad flu season. Yeah. You know, when we lost thousands and thousands of people and no one batted an eye mm -hmm. and so when you started hearing some of the rumors about covid i didn't take it more seriously i had no more concern than i had in flu seasons of the past right a really bad flu season just a bad flu season mm -hmm. get your flu shot yeah you know just do what you're supposed to do right and then at, it became more and more of a reality. Mm -hmm. So upper management administration became more distressed about resources. So mm -hmm. resources became a, five, a vital component of everything that we did. Are we gonna have enough resources? I worked at IU Health North, okay. and we became a COVID hospital. And okay. we were worried about, are we gonna have enough ventilators? Are we gonna have enough PPE for our staff? Mm -hmm. and, um, and so we took our pediatric ICU and our pediatric floor, and we took it out of that hospital because we were Riley North. Oh, yeah. And we moved all of our pediatrics down to Riley and converted wow. all of their rooms mm -hmm. into negative airflow flow rooms. And if you drive by IU Health North, mm -hmm. you can see if you see a hole in the like a window, like scattered, those are makeshift COVID rooms. Wow. So they're probably. 30 when you drive by and see them. So what are the holes in the window for? Negative airflow. Got yeah. it. Okay. So we were just makeshifting, you know, trying Making to it make work. it happen. Yeah. Make it work. And, um, and then there was so much fear about how we can safely take care of patients. Mm -hmm. And so there was, you had to gown properly and mm -hmm. you can only have so many people in the room. And then everything that we did about patient care changed. Mm -hmm. Like if someone coded, we didn't intubate them right away. They had to have return of pulse because every time we intubated one of those patients, we put everyone in the room at risk. Mm. And so you had to start prioritizing and being very um, careful about how you took care of patients. Mm -hmm. But it was stressful to take yeah. care of those patients. People were afraid to have to be the ones to go in into the, the room. room. 
doctors were afraid to have to be the one to intubate patients. Mm. A lot of doctors opted out to not be in that situation because they felt too at risk. Yeah. And um, but when they came in in the beginning of the disease, we we didn't really know how to manage the disease. Mm -hmm. We knew that people got sick quickly, mm -hmm. and we intubated them very early on mm -hmm. and then moved them to the ICU. And that's really what we did in the beginning. We would take sick patients, we would try to get them intubated in, into the ICU as soon as we could. Mm -hmm. And um, and so that's the beginning. Yeah. So um, it, you had asked me a question before. I don't know if you were asking me a question on how things changed in the yeah. evolution of Oh, Absolutely, care. yeah, and, and how it sort of affected not just you, but sort of the community of health workers that mm -hmm. you worked with, the ER mm -hmm. staff, because I even know that just the little bit I know about healthcare, that the ER in the is is just a different sort of mm -hmm. life. Right. Like you have to be on different cylinders yes. at all times right. than other floors. Right. And so how did that change? How did all of the, the evolution of COVID sort of changed the evolution of your relationship because you know mm -hmm. you always had to be on so you had that yeah. humor right? right that kept you all mm -hmm. strong and together but then when this new thing comes on and everyone is probably I mean I'm assuming correct me if I'm wrong but at 10 all the time like just making sure mm -hmm. that everything's okay like what was the how, how how was the evolution of your relationship in that situation so i i've always said i'm only as good as my nurses mm -hmm. my nurses are just my champions mm -hmm. and they're amazing and we work to, you work together as a team yeah and so you have this really strong core of people that you trust and believe in and they trust and believe in you yeah and in the beginning we just kind of were like a assembly line factory and we didn't we weren't accountable for the actions that we did we didn't have to see patients up on the floor mm -hmm. we didn't weren't responsible of what we did in the emergency room and then what ultimately happened on the floor mm -hmm. so as time progressed we started to see some of the results of our actions of what we had done mm. so you know as, as we progress through months of COVID you realize that there's this whole population that were separated from their families and what a terrible thing we yeah. did when we didn't realize that yeah. so like in nursing homes they never saw their families for maybe 18 months mm -hmm. and you would have these people come in to your ER to intubate them and code them with COVID mm -hmm. because we kind of just stuck a bunch of COVID nursing home people, they say the nursing home. Mm -hmm. And then you would talk to their families and their families hadn't seen them for 15 months. Wow. And these people were dying alone. Mm -hmm. And like, we were responsible for that. Like we were responsible for that. So my can you, practice- Can you just tell me a little bit more about that? How are you responsible for that? Well, we were responsible for this whole generation of patients that we we took them into the emergency room, mm -hmm. we intubated them, mm -hmm. we sent them to the ICU, and they were therefore isolated from their families to either pass on or to survive, but for months they were by themselves. Mm. Nursing homes, because we, create, we had an overwhelming need in the emergency department we had limited resources mm -hmm. we tried to keep our nursing patients at nursing facilities unless they really needed to come into the hospital because at the nursing home they were allowed to have a visitor they were not they allowed. weren't no even they stopped there. having visitors okay. but we just didn't have the resources mm -hmm. so then when you would start to get those patients that had exceeded the care ability of their facilities mm -hmm. and you would talk to families they would say, I haven't seen this person in months. Mm -hmm. And that was that was really hard. And so my practice started to change. And okay. so I realized that I had a responsibility not to just the patient, mm -hmm. the COVID patient, but I had a responsibility to the COVID family. Mm -hmm. And that when a patient came in, you know, we could intubate you right away, but I can put you on high flow right now, and I want you to get on the phone, and I want you to FaceTime, and I want you to tell every one of your family yeah. things that you want them to know mm. before I take your voice away from you. 
So my practice changed wow. really quickly. I had a patient that came in and she she had already passed a bit away, but they were still doing CPR. And mm -hmm. I called the family and I said, where are you? Are you close enough that you can come be with, I will bring you into the room mm -hmm. and you can be with her. And as we stop resuscitative efforts. And I was able to do that and knew this wow. family and saw her story on TV. Her daughter was a nurse at the hospital and she became an ambassador for COVID vaccinations wow. because she said that her mom would have been eligible for the vaccine and it was, you know, but mm. that was the same family. I at least got some of her family to be there with her in the end. Yeah. So my practice began to change a lot mm -hmm. as I became more focused on the family yeah. and how to care for the family. And if this person was not going home, what was the legacy you were going to leave? Yes, that is beautiful. That is incredible. And I am sure that that adjustment in your practice, what which was, you know, just thinking a little harder about what the overall experience would mm -hmm. be like has changed lives, mm -hmm. has made things different for people and has affected their life in a way that has brought meaning to those last days of their loved one. So that is huge and amazing. And thank you so much wow. for seeing the people mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and I'm sure at that time um, it may have been hard because it was a lot going on, you know, at the time. But to be able to take a pause and see the human being and the life that they had mm -hmm. outside of the walls right. of that hospital yeah. is incredible and life changing mm -hmm. for that person and for their loved ones. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge deal. Yeah, that's a huge deal. So thank you so yeah. much for that. Yeah, and and that's really kind of you know, how things transpired and evolved with Rodney when I found out that Rodney was sick. Yeah. It was already at that point in my life where I realized that there was so much more mm -hmm. to this, the battling of this terrible disease. Yeah. And that it wasn't just my ability to intervene in that one moment in time in the emergency department. Mm -hmm. um, it takes, you know, 10 or 15 minutes to intubate someone and get them on a ventilator and get all of that stuff done. Mm -hmm. But that your responsibility to people you love and care goes beyond that. Yeah. And so um, at, at one time, we were really inundated with a lot of COVID patients. Mm -hmm. And the staff was really overworked, stressed. Mm -hmm. They had to wear the same PPE mm -hmm. at one point. They were scared. I remember one of the nurses, her mask came down as she was suctioning a patient, and she came to the ER because she was hysterical that she was going to die mm -hmm. as a result. She wanted to take care of patients, but she was terrified to do it. Yeah. So there's so much stress. Patients were in a room, essentially, in these, you know, the ICU, and getting great medical care, mm -hmm. but they were alone. Mm -hmm. And usually in an ICU, you're surrounded by people who love you yeah. and you tell the nurses how great this person is yeah. and then the nurses become invested in that patient because yes. they have a personal relationship. Right. This did not happen. Every room was just a blank canvas with patients on ventilators and they... You didn't know their stories. You didn't know their story and you really were just getting in there and you wanted to get right back out because yeah. you're terrified to be in For there. For yourself. Right. Yeah. So these people were just... It, on you know ventilators mm -hmm. by themselves and then you know Rodney came mm -hmm. and you know he's my man yeah and uh, he began to not do well mm -hmm. and um, nobody was allowed visitors but I was I was gonna be his visitor mm -hmm. so I would gown up and I would take my stuff my own personal stuff and then I would tell his wife what do you want to tell him do you have a prayer for him mm -hmm. send me a prayer and I'll play that I put my my own personal phone in a Ziploc bag and would lay it next to his head and she would pray over him. And so we would do that on a regular basis. And then I thought, this man is not doing well. Mm -hmm. He's going to probably die. Mm -hmm. And I reached out to Stacy mm -hmm. and Holly and Kelly. And we had a driving conference mm -hmm. in my driveway. 
And I said, I don't know if I believe in miracles, but if you want to show me one, like my heart's open. Yeah. And so we just decided we were going to do more. Um, we were going to let the nurses, let the people. I wanted the nurses at IU Health North to know who they were taking care of. Mm. So I contacted all of his family and said, send me his pictures, every picture you have. And Holly went and got them put on cardboard. Mm. And then I said, I want his, his flying coasters music. I want his favorite jazz music. And mm -hmm. Sheena, I want you to make a prayer CD. We took three CDs and Holly brought a boom box. And I went to the charge nurse and I said, you need to know this man. He is a really good man, mm -hmm. and we have to fight for him. Mm -hmm. And so we surrounded his room in these pictures, and I said to the nurses, just have the boom box going 24 hours a day. Just let him hear it. Just let yeah. him hear it. And then we decided... I have to goosebumps. <laughs> oh, well, my I goodness. Wanted, I wanted people to be held accountable and know who they were caring yes. for. I wanted them to have a little bit of fight in it. Yeah. And um, and then I said, and he, the, this hospital needs to know who they're taking care of. So I went to Lowe's, we brought flags, I had everybody write their favorite passages on it and mm -hmm. put it in the um, yard outside of his window. We found out where his window was, we put a heart on the window, and then we, you know, organized that prayer vigil. It wrapped yes. all the way around the hospital. Yes. And people prayed, and the nurses taking care of him in the ICU are standing looking from the window. People in the room. In in the room, mm. yeah. And then people are coming out, nurses are coming out and praying. And um, I just felt like we had such a responsibility mm -hmm. to fight in a different way. Yeah. Not like, you know, adjusting its ventilator. Sure. But in a different way. Yeah. And like human connection. Yes. Way. And... Um, and then you know the rest of the story. Yes, that's Easter I, day. He came Easter, off the ventilator, Easter so. morning. He came off the ventilator. I imagine that this act of making him a human and helping his body and his subconscious mind hear his wife, yeah. hear music. Mm -hmm hear his loved ones on the outside of the building. All of those things were very integral and very important to his recovery mm -hmm. and to his spirit, for, for his subconscious mind and his spirit to recognize those things and hear those things. And it could very well be one of the main reasons he is still on this planet today is because you decided to think outside of the box and and do something that had not and was not really able to be done for the other patients that were there and i think that it's also a huge testament to how human connectivity is so important in when even when we're healthy but especially when we're not right right and and like i said show me a miracle but there was a feeling like the power of prayer. Mm -hmm. There was a feeling people really like that was their their heart was out there. Yeah, and to have so many people really focused yeah. on one thing, and then lo and behold, you know. And I'm I'm sure that this this was obviously extremely beneficial for Rodney and Rodney's life and the loved ones around him. But I cannot imagine that this wasn't something that wasn't also a source of rejuvenation for the staff that oh. got to participate. Did you see when Rodney went home? Yes. It was a celebration <laughs> yes. of every floor. He had to stop at every floor. It was wow. such a celebration because... You know, there were so many people that never were right didn't able to get meet. to go out yeah. in that manner, and um, and then just to actually see and feel and participate, and you felt like everyone had a part in it. Yeah, you know, yes. everybody had a part. In everyone it. was invested. Yeah. And this was something that everyone needed to see happen. Right. You know, right. this person who was almost gone, yeah. like so many others mm -hmm. who had been there. Mm -hmm. But you all worked together physically and spiritually right. to make it so that this person got to leave. And in the darkest, I mean, 
I would say in the darkest, the worst moment for in Rodney's, if you look at his vitals and where mm -hmm. he was mm -hmm. and his complications, and to see that when you're at the very bottom, that you shouldn't give up hope yet. Yeah. Because as happened. long as you're breathing. Yeah. Even I mean, if it's on a ventilator. Right, right. <laughs> or, you know, he had every single complication. He'd had a stroke and a GI bleed and I, his kidney shut down and he had respiratory failure and cardiac failure. He did everything in that hospital but die. Mm. And he came back to tell everyone about his journey. Wow. And so. Wow. And that journey had a huge important part of it and that was you oh and thank okay. you so much i have to tell you one little piece yes ironic yeah so my mom passed away this january from mm, covid I'm four sorry. weeks before her vaccination wow so it's still there yeah we're still fighting it's, you're still in it mm -hmm. right it's still happening yeah. and it's not it's not something that um we can say done right. you know we all have a responsibility absolutely mm -hmm. absolutely to continue to not only help ourselves but to help our fellow humans and hopefully if anything has come out of this pandemic and all of the things that we've had to sacrifice as a human community is that we we belong to each other and we have to take care of each other. And if that means staying apart from each other or um, washing our hands or wearing a mask or getting vaccinated, mm -hmm. whatever that is, we still have a duty to each other. And um, that duty that you had to your fellow human during the, the hardest hit part of this um, pandemic is beautiful and amazing and i just want to thank you as as a part of your human <laughs> community thank you so much for that work that you did but also because of my close relationship with rodney thank you so much yeah. for for changing just adjusting your practice yeah. to help everyone on a spiritual level too that's important and incredible Thank you so much for sharing your story here with us today. <laughs> I don't even know what we would do without this story. This is so great. Thank you so yeah, much no, for being yeah. with us. Thank you. And being a part of the C19 yeah. experience. Thank you. I told you I'm a weeper. I love it. Look, I'm over I here too. Like, oh my I'm goodness. So it's so good. No, yeah. it's perfect. Thank you. Thank you.